Thank you. I've forgotten about that. Please just remind me. I should have done it to begin with. So. No, that means you have to repeat everything you just said. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the recap from last week. So it's already, that part is already recorded. So remember, this is what he spoke while Solomon was still alive. Now, what we didn't talk about is what happens immediately following this. Solomon hears about this and says, I'm going to kill you, Jeroboam. So Jeroboam runs to Egypt, all right? Spends the rest of his time in Egypt up until the death of Jeroboam, I mean, of, excuse me, Solomon, and the son of Solomon, Rehoboam. Now I'm going to try not to get those confused. Mm -hmm. Point it out just so we're clear, all right? Mm -hmm. So now remember, we're in 1 Kings 11, all right? Now we go to... Oh, that's right. It had already advanced here. It didn't even. Fair. All right. So now we're in chapter 12. So just a little bit of time has passed. Solomon has died. Okay. Rehoboam is now king. And remember, the people came to Rehoboam and said, hey, your daddy was really, really tough on us. Go light on us. And then Solomon said, you know what? I'm going to go talk. You come back in three days and then. Solomon said that? I'm sorry. Thank you. Rehoboam, Solomon's dead. Solomon did not say that. Rehoboam says, you guys come back in three days, all right? And I'm going to, and while he's doing that, he consults, okay? He consults with the elders and said, yes, if you lighten the yoke that your father put on them, they'll stay with you. This is with elders. And then he talked to some people he grew up with, and they said, hey, here's what you're going to tell them. Tell them that your father's loins were smaller than your all right, so he goes back and he says all of this stuff, and they said, you know, what do we have to do with you? And I'm trying to give you a whole lot of time, or a whole lot of verses here in a very short, short period of time. After that, the ten northern kings, they go off, they call back Jeroboam, Jeroboam comes to Israel, okay, he is instituted, installed as king, all right? That's what we pick up here. It says, Jeroboam said in his heart, remember, this is the internal workings, both the mental and the emotional aspect here is what we're talking about. This is everything about Jeroboam internally. He said, now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord. Lowercase Lord. That is not Yahweh. That is the earthly king even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king, this is Jeroboam, consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold, your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. Jeroboam did not believe what God said. Although, at the point of him saying this, God had already fulfilled the first part of the prophecy. Hmm. But he, he made him king. This is the starting of the northern kingdom. Mm -hmm. He says, you know what? I don't trust God. In fact, Israel, here are your gods. Two golden calves. There's so much more that we're going to cover later. <laughs> we don't want to get too derailed on it. But this is important. This is the starting of the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Is it on a good footing? No. And as you're going to see, still in this first reign, it gets worse. In fact, it never gets better. The best part of the prophecy was the very beginning when Solomon was still alive. But Jeroboam said in his heart, God can't do it or won't do it. And that's the foundation for the Northern Kingdom. All right, now I'm going to, oops, try to do the right thing here. But what I'm doing is I'm changing the view. You don't see any of that. It pauses, fortunately. <laughs> However, on my end, it's a, it's a bit over. Oh, whoops. You know what? No. All right. I got ahead of myself. I apologize.
the, the problem is it's switching back and forth in the PowerPoint, from PowerPoint back into Logos. So well, keep in mind here, this is our little showing of our kings. Here's Solomon right here. He's the guy who died. This is where we are, the beginning. Rehoboam was his son of the north or the southern, right? And then Jeroboam the one, this is Jeroboam the one. There is one later that we will talk about today, which is we just refer to him as Jeroboam the two. They're not father and son, okay? They are almost 200 years apart and actually of different lineages, okay? They're of different family lines. They're not the same. They just have the same first name. So we call him Jeroboam one to delineate from Jeroboam two. So we can get, and then the Bible will call him Jeroboam the son of, but for us, it's a little bit easier for us just to say Jeroboam 1 and Jeroboam 2. All right. We started the class with a phrase. Some of you are here for this exercise, except I think a lot of you weren't. <laughs> Those who are here for the exercise, what was the exercise here? What was the question? Does anybody remember? Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? And I think you guys were the only ones that were in here, right? Was anybody else here? Were you in here for that? I don't know. You might have. All right. So we went through an entire exercise talking about what does this mean? So for about three seconds, what did we determine, Troy? There was not a what? Enough? There's no context. There's no context. We came up with like four or five different meanings for that and, and, and what, what it could mean. So this could mean a whole lot of things. And we went around the room and we talked, well, we didn't go around the room. We opened it up. What does this mean? And we had a bunch of different ideas. And my question to them was still consistently, how do you know? Hmm. How do you know? And how do you know? The phrase has no particular meaning in its current context without more. So then I added context in and we came up with different plausible scenarios. And then we came up with the one as the author intended, which one was correct. All right. But without context, we don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. We're just guessing, right? And the point was, is the only right understanding of what that phrase meant is what the person who wrote it, spoke it, said it, typed it in this case, was thinking. Without the proper context and going back to trying to figure that out and figuring out what the author's intent was, we're going to misunderstand words, mm -hmm. right? So we could take this saying, and just simply put it to this. How are we going to know what it means without what? The context. Yes. All right. Yes. And there is varying levels of context. All right. We got the word. A word has no meaning without other words. And we'll do a little exercise later to further that point out. But without context, we're not going to know what it means. So you've got the immediate context. The word has no meaning without other words. Those other words are put into sentences. Those sentences into paragraphs, paragraphs into chapters. In this case, we're talking about the Bible. And those chapters put into books, right? Those books are then put in a grouping with other books. Those other books are put into groupings with other divisions of books. We would call that the Old Testament, the New Testament. In fact, in the case when we're talking about the, um, we have subgroups inside of those two, Old Testament and New Testament, right? And then we got the whole context of the entire Bible. It all has to work together to have the proper context. Okay? So what we've done is we've spent some time the last few weeks establishing some context. All right? We established that Nineveh is one part of the Assyrian Empire. If you weren't here for that, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we did. All right? We also established... Um, I don't know what the right word is. How evil for lack of a better term, the Assyrians were. We looked at, really, truly, we looked at some of the historical evidences for those beliefs, both in pictures and reliefs, as well as we did look a little bit of writing. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time in writing because, honestly, the pictures do as good of a job as the documents with depicting it. But um, for those who did not. But Jonah, the book of Jonah, so we established that. We established the fact that God does actually care and has always cared about all the people. All right. So in the case of Jonah in Nineveh, we know that God is sending Jonah to Nineveh to call out Nineveh for its grotesque violence that it's been doing. So remember, God not only cares for Nineveh, but God also cares for the people Nineveh has been hurting. Mm -hmm. So it's a double full thing. It's just like Sodom. Remember, we go we go all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. The evil of Sodom has God has heard the cries of the evil of Sodom. 
okay? It's not just what they're doing, but remember, they're all God's children. We are all God's children. So when one child hurts another child, that situation is just painful for the parent, mm. right? I mean, it doesn't really matter which child was right or wrong in that sense for the fact that the both inflicts pain upon the parent. So God hurts and God suffers when we tear each other up, mm. all right? So he's totally, we've seen the biblical argument where one, the foreigners could still come to God during the eighth century, all right? We looked at that last week during the book of uh, in the book of the law. How there are several laws that, that govern not just the Jewish nation, but also those who are wishing to come and seek God, and how there are provisions under the law for the Jew and the non-Jew. And I made it a point where several of those statements, and I want to make this very very clear, where there were several of those statements that you will have one law that was in particular in context talking about a particular group in a scenario in a section of the law. The whole law did not apply to everybody. It did not apply to everybody in the Jewish nation. The easiest is you have certain regulations for the priesthood, the Levitical system, as well as all those were out. That's three groups within inside of the nation of Israel that had different rules and different regulations. But there were some universals and some overlaps, and that's what we were looking at in that particular sense. So don't think that it was all, okay? Meaning all of those laws, all 613 of them, apply to everybody equally. They did not. Okay, just like the laws about driver's license. If you don't have a driver's license, it doesn't necessarily apply to you. So, you know, Daniel doesn't have to look both ways before I turn the car, does he? You know, Daniel's my little five-year-old mm -hmm. sitting in the car. That's not relevant for them. It's not relevant to the driver. They need to look both ways, right? All right. But we spent some time establishing context for the book of Jonah, all right? And hopefully in this class, we'll wrap up our contextual, our, our focus on context. But the book of Jonah has captivated the hearts and the minds of people for centuries. Now, I know there are people who have preached in this room. And for those who have preached in this room, I want you to think in your mind about preaching. All right. Those who have actually preached a sermon. All right. Or those who have even, in the case of how we do it here, preside over the table currently from the pulpit. Right, we would commonly refer to that as the pulpit. All right, so I want you to think about it. So think about the fact that Jonah has captivated the hearts and the minds. And the problem is, is during my research, I found some really interesting stuff that there's really no good segue, but I got to just share it. So imagine that. <laughs> That's a pulpit. <laughs> Could you imagine preaching from the open, gaping mouth of the fish that swallowed Jonah? <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys weren't as tickled by it. <laughs> wow. But I just, I couldn't, you know, there are Jonah churches and there are Jonah pulpits. And um, I, I was just surprised about it. But it's just one of those things. Sometimes we can take things a little bit far. Uh -huh. Well. Okay. Oh, I should have told you where that one was. All right, so that one is the Peter and Paul Church in Poland. Hmm. This is the St. Hedwig Church in Poland. There is city names, but I'm not going to butcher any more than I have to. And how would you like the golden one? This one looks like the uh, the, the, the preacher is going to be thrown up at the point where the fish is regurgitating. <laughs> but minus the sharp teeth that's on it as well. But that's the St. Martin Church in the Czech Republic. This is the St. James the Greater Church in the Czech Republic. Here is one in Croatia. And then this, this is the most grand of all. This is the boat, I think, is what they're supposed to be going for there. So at least I guess in that aspect, you know, they're preaching from the boat. And I guess it's before he gets thrown over, so the seas are still kind of rough there and all that. But that's in Austria. So just some of those fun things that really don't fit in anywhere, but show you how Jonah has captivated the hearts and the minds of people. I wasn't aware that church is focused on Jonah, the Jonah story. Yeah. So I was confusing either. to me. I wasn't either. <laughs> Out of everything in the Bible. Okay. Well, so, you know, I, I don't, there's, you know, chapter four of the book of opinions. So 
I, I could go down that road and all that, but, but truly, I don't, I, I don't have an answer as to why somebody would thought that was appropriate. But if you notice, there's a lot of ornateness and all that stuff. So I don't know exactly. And they're kind of, if you look in a geographical area, these are all very focused. So the way I came upon this is because one of the commentaries I was reading was written by a guy who did his PhD. He's a Lutheran in Germany who wrote his PhD on Jonah. So he actually visited all these places. So he had mentioned them and all that stuff. So if you actually just Google Jonah pulpits, hmm. you'll actually find it. In fact, if you see this little symbol over here, I actually went ahead and just put the hyperlinks in for each one of them. Um, but there's actually one website that, that chronicles most of these and then all that. So there are, there are, there are different churches that, that have themes, shall we say? I don't know, but most of these are not new. Most of these, as you could see, were old and ordinary. Mm -hmm. um, part of my time during the Yacht Club, I visited several thousand plus year old churches and all that. You might want to explain what you mean by your time in the Yacht Club. All right. Uncle Sam's Yacht Club. Oh. Do I got any sailors? <laughs> the Navy. So Yes, Navy. So I, I spent a little bit of uh, time there in an Uncle Sam's Yacht Club. So in the Navy. Thank you. So. <laughs> I make subtle jokes like that because the sailors in the room will get it. Nobody else will. So I, might not be I, I understand that, but that's okay. <laughs> so I, I, I have had the, the, the fortune, misfortune, however you want to look at it, of, of going to a lot of these places and seeing some really neat, ornate, and very, very old places. Okay. Um, and, you know, you see that. You see that at a certain time frame, there was more gilding. There was more of a lot, okay, um, because that's what it was at the time. And we could even go into the historical aspect of that, but honestly, that is so far off subject that we will totally run. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that being said, I'm going to do this whole little switch over because I forgot I was going to show you all that. But we've seen that Jonah has truly gone a little bit too far in some ways, right? People have taken the idea. Oh, I thought I'd pause it, but I didn't pause it. So you got to see all of that stuff. So I apologize for y'all having to, to, to view all of that, you know? It's like when you're, when you're changing over, remember the overhead projectors? Remember, mm -hmm. transparencies, you were supposed to turn it off and then flip it over. You were never supposed to change it out while it was on because you could, if you raise it up, you'll blind everything. Or yourself. It's like you're not supposed to go right and talk forward side to side. It's supposed to be up and down and all of these little things, right? You're not supposed to the behind the scenes side of it, you're not supposed to see, but to switch it back over. So we have, all right. I'm not sure why that one still wants to show up there, but we'll just let it go there. But the book of John, all right? Who, or well, let me ask you this. Because we just talked about all of these um, extremities, shall we say, when it comes to Jonah, what have you heard about Jonah? Notice I said heard about Jonah. What have you heard? Heard, yeah. Oh, that he was swallowed by a fish. Okay. And... Um, to, to begin with, God had told him to go somewhere, but he didn't want to, mm -hmm. and he ended up being swallowed by a fish. Absolutely. Okay, but after that, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Okay, but what have you heard? We've talked about already once in this class about the story being filled in. It, it was a whale. It was a whale. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. That's what I heard. Yeah, sure. But we'll look at that word that's actually in the Hebrew there. It just means a fish. It's it's okay. It's it's kind of honestly one of the relevant points. <laughs> it's a it's a sea creature. That's what matters, right? It's a fish. Yeah. It's that. The Hebrew word is that, and it's a fish. But what have we heard? But then three days later, he was uh, after the fish engulfed him. He he was spit out of the fish. Yeah, yeah, okay. it was vomited out. It's yeah. actually an accurate translation of Hebrew there. Not spewed, you can say spewed, that's fine. But to say he just set him on the shoulder, totally missed the point of what the author's telling us. Yeah. He was thrown up, regurgitated. What have we heard? 
we haven't heard any of the fun stuff. So we're not going to go down that path if we have it. If you get into a lot of the um, extra biblical, the Jewish thoughts on that, they come up and they try to fill in the backstory of Jonah considerably. But if we're not aware of that, there's no need to mm -hmm. introduce and to go down a side down that. So in the book of Jonah, some things that we need to do to further establish the book of Jonah is we need to understand what type of writing it is. We would call that the genre because you interpret different types of writings in different methods, right? So when we look at Jonah, Jonah is encompassed with inside of the prophets. We've talked about that. We would call, some would call them the minor prophets, and that is one way to actually refer to them as the minor prophets. But that also gives us this misnomer, the thinking that the minor prophets means the lesser prophets and the others. No, what it means is how many words they use. Jonah, by the way, is four chapters, 47 verses, or is it 48? 47 or 48, it's one of the two numbers. It's a, it's a small, small, all right? However, it has nothing to do with the quality. It's talking about quantity. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, it's not called the Minor Prophets. It's called the Book of the Twelve, because there are 12 Minor Prophets, all right? And it's included in the Book of the Twelve. That we have to establish, although it's in the prophecies, what type of prophecy it is, and or not prophecy, but what type of genre it is, all right? Because although it's located in the Book of Prophecies, it's not really prophetic. Mm -hmm. There's five Hebrew words, which in the NASB are translated into eight English words, a prophecy. That's it. That's it. That's all there is. So what is it? Well, it's a narrative. It's a story. Now, there are those who do not believe that Jonah is historical. We've already talked about that. By the way, I've stated my position in the way I'm teaching the class. Yes, it happened. He was swallowed, he was spit back up, and he said, yes, I'm going to go. All right? All of that is what the Bible says, and I believe it. I swallowed it. Book one. See? <laughs> See, most of you weren't here on day one, so I can reuse the same corny jokes, right? But it actually happened. Now, there are those who will be professing Christians who will say Jonah didn't actually happen. They will say that Jonah is actually just an extended metaphor that Jonah is a parable mm. that is written in the form of satire, comedy, right? However, I don't see how that holds. Now, we've already talked about once the simple name Jonah. We talked about Jonah and we talked about the simple fact that Jonah is actually a person who actually lived. Do we remember that, right? Yeah. Second Kings chapter 14, verse 25 says that Jonah, all right, the son of Am Amittai, he went and prophesied through this guy named Jeroboam, the two, the second, all right, and said that he's going to retake all of this area for Israel. And we looked at that, okay? And during that reign of Jeroboam the second, he actually did do just that. He took back territory. In fact, Jonah's hometown is within the territory Jeroboam actually took back because Jonah is from Gath Hefer. But the simple fact that Jonah is listed as delivering a prophecy from God, the northern king, tells us that he actually lived. All right? So Jonah is a person. He is a prophet. The Bible tells us he's a prophet. We have talked about the fact that Jonah is actually mentioned several times in the Bible. All right? In Matthew chapter 4, I mean chapter 16, verse Four, Jesus is talking, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. A sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. All right? In Luke chapter 29, I mean, Luke chapter 11, verse 20, he says, as the crowd were increasing, he began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so the Son of Man will be to this generation. So clearly, Jonah is known, He's right? Been. Known. Known, I guess. Because when Jesus referenced Jonah, the assumption is that the people knew who Jonah was that he was referencing, right? right? Is that, that that same idea, right? And then we have... Matthew chapter 12, which is, might be where we most 
commonly think of when we think of Jesus and, and Jonah. It says, but he answered, this is Jesus, saying to, said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. So Jesus calls him a prophet. For just as there, Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, and we'll talk about that from there in a little bit, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. More importantly than that. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of God. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. I think that pretty much answers the question as to whether it's a parable or not. Have you heard that uh, parable feeling about uh, Job as well? There, there are people who will say that Job was not an actual historical event. All right. Um, I disagree with that. I, I, the reason I ask is because I'd never heard it about this. I'd heard it about it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I was in a men's class on a Wednesday night one time. There's an elder teaching the class. I'm sitting next to another elder. He's teaching the, the parable that it was a parable. Mm. And I'm sitting there about to lose my, you know, and I'm hitting this guy. Are you going to let this go on? Are you going to let this go on? Mm -hmm. uh, stop stop him you know this we, we've got a false prophet here in front of us. <laughs> and uh, he yeah. said whether you believe it or not it's the story is the same the teaching is the same so let's just calm down Steve. Okay. <laughs> well i wouldn't hold to that i'm glad that you get excited about it because i would get excited mm -hmm. about it too because honestly if you think of it as a parable mm -hmm. it's not the same does anybody remember my example to say that these don't prove that john is real you wouldn't because you weren't here. So I'll retell the same story. So about two weeks before Christmas, I'm on my way back up to Jacksonville from Daytona. There's a rest stop on 95, and many of you have probably been there. So I've been on the road since then, so about whatever it is, an hour or so, this traffic wasn't the greatest. I get out of the truck. I go to the rest stop. I park, and I park in one of the first spots as you first get off, so I have a longer walk there and back. I spend a lot of time driving my profession going to work. I need to go to do what I got to go do. And I, I, as I'm getting out, I'm not really thinking of anything. I'm kind of looking down. I hear this. All right. Then I, I look up and I see this man laying on the ground, this phone in this hand, mm. in this hand, and he's doing one of these numbers. All right. So I had my own little good Samaritan moment. Do I be a Levite? <laughs> do I be a priest? Can I just kind of walk around? Mm -hmm. Or do I walk up and see if I can render some sort of assistance? So, who understands what I mean when I say a Samaritan? Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, did Samaritan have to happen for you to understand what I meant? You just had another story. All right. So, these words of Jesus, with the exception of... <clears throat> You should have been in the same place I was. Mm. You've been stuck in Job the whole time, or uh, Jonah the whole time. I'm sorry because I've been pulling this through. So this was on pause and this wasn't. So that whole transition part, I forgot to restart the sharing. So I apologize for that. But now are we there? Yep. All right. So when I keep pointing back up to that, I'm thinking I'm pointing to the Bible in the text. So this is the NASB for those who haven't been with us. This is the Logos Bible software program. Don't pay attention to this unless I point it out, and don't pay attention to this. The text is here in the middle, all right? That's that's the, the point of the matter. So you can use whatever translation you want as well. This is just displayed for the ease so everybody can see the words that I'm going to read out when I'm reading it out. But we read all of those, and, and over here on my end, I read it from the computer because it was supposed to be displaying over there, but I forgot to reshare this. As I told you, there's some technological issues I've got to overcome here at this place as I'm teaching through. So... Because this is working as a second monitor, but it's only working because it's sharing through Zoom. So it's it's not really. This is everybody's watching to see the same thing. Now, because you all understood the story of the Samaritan, because you know the parable of the Good Samaritan, you could understand me relating it to it, mm -hmm. using it as imagery, right? It's only because you know it, you can understand it. It did not matter. And I think we all know the Good Samaritan did not happen, right? That was a parable in the sense of it did not happen. 
Right. In that particular case. In that particular case. That's what we're talking about. An example of why all of those statements where Jesus references Jonah and the sign of Jonah do not necessarily require that Jonah actually happen. That's all I'm saying. I, I, we need to know what you did. Huh? Did you help the dude or not? Excuse me, are you having a seizure? <laughs> yeah. Are you having a seizure? Do you want help? Yeah. Okay. And as he became responsive and all that, yes, I did call him. By the way, it took like 25 minutes for the EMS wow. to show up. Um, mm -hmm. Another gentleman did come up. Oh, I'm I know you. I, everybody I'm else already knew all this. So <laughs> nobody else was here. I'm trying to get a club hanger. No, nobody came back. We could the New Year's resolution. They said we're going to go to class more, and then I killed our New Year's resolution after the first after the first Sunday. I, I did it. All right. <laughs> but yes, his name was Matthew. By the way, he was a very large gentleman, and, and um, why exactly he passed out was unknown. He was not necessarily feeling well. However, he became more responsive as I was on the phone with nine one one. So I think they slowed down the fire truck. So, um, however, you know, he was by the time um, the EMS showed up. He was standing. He was. He felt comfortable enough to stand. So um, I and another gentleman uh, stayed there with him until EMS showed up. And then you know, once you can't be a service, then you move on. You know. But um, there was no real true first aid needed. Just you know that whole come alongside somebody and all that. Like people who actually know what they're going to do. Something. So does that answer your question? Are you happy with that answer? <laughs> We're good. However, <laughs> so I have my breathing mask and everything else. I can talk with CPR. <laughs> but he was having a seizure because of the way his hands were shaking and all that stuff. Um, I've run into that situation when I was very. I mean, it's interesting because stuff like that happens to people all the time, and they make that decision, and we make the same decisions. And what do we? And it's. I never made the decision. It's cost. It wasn't a decision. I'll be honest with you. No, the only I, reason I filled that out is to give the illustration for, for the Samaritan. I didn't actually think about it. That's what I did. As soon as I saw fall, are you okay? I was still like 20 feet away. So, you know, that's, you know, that, that just as a heads up, I, I, I will be the one who stops. If I can render assistance, then I don't think about should I. It's whether I have something to offer or not. If I'm going to be in the way, then I'm going to move on through because there's no need. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I cut you off, Steve. I <laughs> I want to verify. I never thought about it. I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Jesus refers to Jonah as a, an actual prophet. Yes, he does. And so that would lend credence to the fact that this is this story is real, what happened there. Is well, yes, I'm just giving you, I, I'm not saying that it can't be. What I'm giving you is the truth that somebody who you use that argument through can just simply throw it back and say it could be looked at as the other. Except there's one point here that I would, I would stand up. And it says, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation. This generation he's talking about, the people he's directly addressing, they were real. <clears throat> they will stand up. Therefore, by implication, if the men of Nineveh are going to stand up, they should have been real as well. And the reason they're going to stand up is because they did what? They repented. And I'm sorry, plot spill, spoiler here for you. We're going to bring this back up again when we get there in chapter 3 and chapter 4. But he actually uses them as a real example with people who are actually going to be there. So they, I think it actually happened besides the fact that Jonah in the book of Jonah tells us nothing that gives us no indication that it didn't happen. All right. It's just that simple. There's no indication inside of the context of the story that would give us the reason to think it didn't happen. All right. And in fact, it's not until I shouldn't say that scholarship wise. All right. Up until the last hundred, 150 years has always held that Jonah historically happened. That, that's the way scholarship has been. But if you study postmodernism thought and all that, then you'll understand where all that went, the demythalization movement and all of that that has occurred and has wrecked havoc in our educational system. We'll know and we'll see, right? However, back in that time, in fact, we'll look at a comment that Jerome, all right, guy from the fourth century, all right, um, one of the church scholars at the time and all that, he writes in his commentary on, uh, uh, on Jonah, that even at that time, people have a hard time believing that a fish swallowed Jonah. And Jerome's point is quite simple. If you're a believer and you got a problem with that, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> what about those three boys that got in that furnace and they walked out and they ate mm -hmm. smoke? Yeah. Because yeah, that's not enough. That's not natural. 
<laughs> all right. Well, what, what about what about you know all the other? So he brings up a couple of illustrated points, and that's all just from the Old Testament standpoint. And then he says, now if you're an unbeliever, what about all these other writings? And we're not going to get into any of that because that's irrelevant. Go ahead. Well, I mean, you can carry that all all the way up to the, the, the virgin birth of Christ. You know, people people yes. say that didn't happen. If you can believe the first verse of the Bible in the beginning, God created the heavens mm. and the earth, then you can believe all the rest of that. Well, I would suggest that you can't believe that unless you believe that Christ was God who came to this earth that died on the cross and rose from the grave. If you can believe that, then nothing else should be an issue. That's that's my own personal, and that's the way I always will teach that. I had somebody once start off once once long ago said something very wise. Always start with Christ. Hmm. I do have a burning question. Okay, different from Steve. <laughs> Hold on. Yes, my father-in-law would have said that I was providentially hindered from okay. coming to the first several classes. Well, I want to know, have you already disclosed what was the sign of Jonah? Because you've mentioned it two or three times. And I'm sitting here thinking, what was the sign of Jonah? <laughs> I have not mentioned the sign of Jonah. Okay, all right. But you haven't. I've, I've, I've read <laughs> the sign of Jonah. <laughs> right, because that's in this one as well. And I won't give him but the sign of Jonah, because this is Jonah was three days and three nights and all that. We'll, we'll talk about what we might think the sign of Jonah is. We'll talk about what some experts think the sign of Jonah is, and then we'll talk about what the text says the sign of Jonah is. All right? Oh, oh, spoiler, it doesn't say. <laughs> was he bleached white? Was he thrown up onto the shores of Nineveh? You know, was he just regurgitated in the middle of the city? So, you know, now from a scholarly perspective, uh, honestly, I never even heard that aspect until, oh, great, we're already here. All right. <laughs> I haven't even heard that aspect of Jonah being regurgitated into Nineveh until fairly recent. I have not found a single commentary that will even support something close to that, by the way. So I'm not putting that forward as an idea. I'm just going to tell you that somebody with some characters behind their name said that once, and I thought that was interesting. I'd never even heard. <laughs> now, to the point, Nineveh is located on the Tigris, right? It, Mm -hmm. Between the Tigris and Euphrates River, and there's a little waterway that actually goes through the middle of Nineveh. But I leave it. But it doesn't really matter. It's not. He can do what he wants. So back to this real quick. So we've got a few things with Jonah here that the men of Jonah are referenced in the New Testament for standing up and judging this. We've got Jesus referencing the sign of Jonah, and Jesus references himself being in the tomb for three days coming out as like the sign that was Jonah was in the fish for three days. So we can see that there are a little overlaps there. As we said, this is narrative. This is a story. It's told in story format. Therefore, it matches more along the styles of the prophecies that we find inside of Kings, right? Because Kings talks about prophets and talks about the prophecy, but it's from a an outside perspective. We do not know, as I said on the first class, we do not know who actually wrote the book of Jonah. It is possible that Jonah wrote the book of Jonah. It's also possible that it was written by somebody else at a later point in time in history. We know that at a bare, the late or the latest date, right, the closest to zero BC we can get is 200 BC because the oldest writings we have of a particular Reference book references the book of the 12 as a completed film that which John has always been part of the book of 12 back in 200 okay BC and that's the book of Sirach or um, Ecclesiasticus is another the wisdom of Ben Sirach um, it's not Ecclesiastes that's a different book that's actually a book in the Bible this is not a book of the Bible so uh, let's see here what else do we need to cover up in the last few points so um, there are a few key words that are going to show up. We talked about Jonah is a very short book, but there is this word great, Gadal, that shows up 14 times. All right. All right. 14 times the word great is used in this book as a descriptor, right? Evil, all right, is another one that shows up. It shows up nine times, all right? Arise shows up six times and 
descend or descending, going down, this concept of going down in contrast to, okay, the arise, it shows up four times. So there's some things that we're gonna point out as long as we go and we see that, that the author is making a point and we're gonna try to figure out why it is that he's using these terms and making these points. What we're gonna notice is that every single miracle that occurs inside of the book of Jonah occurs to Jonah, okay? Every miracle that occurs, occurs to Jonah. Another key that we need to look for is how every thing responds to God, All right? How do things respond to God? And I use the word things because not only are the people responding to God, but elements and things are being responded to, are being, are responding to God. We will see that the, the author here is going to use personification for things like the boat and all that and give them that human characteristic. Although there is no human characteristics inside of the boat, they're going to use that as a way to, as a literary form to convey the point. All right. All right, let's see what other things that we need to cover here real quick. And then next week when we get in, we are going to be starting with Jonah. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and we'll close. That was actually a minute early. That's exactly about. I know, but it's a minute early. So we'll close the word of prayer. Oh, sorry. We pray. Father, we come before you humbly and we say thank you. We thank you that you uh, that you didn't cast us out, that you didn't stop when man rebelled and that you've given us numerous opportunities to repent and come to you father we thank you in jesus name we pray amen amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you.